Hi, Paresh, and hi, everyone watching this. This is the second edition of The Idiot Investor. It's not why I've invited Paresh on here, because we meet a lot of idiotic things that people do in investing. You might say, speaking of investing, an idiotic thing is to wear a bright yellow shirt. Uh, this is one of the companies that I've helped set up in the UK. They are NASA technology. And uh, people want to not just do listed companies, Paresh, but they also want to do private companies, as you and I come across quite a few as well. And we will talk about that a little bit later. In other words, what I'm finding is a whole bunch of people who are saying inflation's high, I want to take more risk. Is that idiotic, do you think? Uh, or do you think it seems sensible? What, what's your take on that? The whole bunch of people coming to me saying, I want to take more risk as inflation's high. Yeah, that's an interesting one because, uh, I mean, one doesn't necessarily always have to follow the other. And uh, I guess there's a misconception that when inflation is high, you, you automatically suffer on your investment. It's not always the case if you're buying value, of course, as we know. Um, so it can be, a, and there's so much noise out there. Um, half the battle is sifting through that noise and understanding what is uh, what you should be listening to. And a lot of the time, you, you need to find those very simple uh, parameters that work just for you and your temperament. Actually, so, yeah, if sorry to interrupt, that, that point on value, I don't want that to get lost, um, as opposed to growth. Of course, in high inflation era, people won't know this, but statistically, undervalued companies low price to book ratio, low price to earnings ratio, low price earnings growth ratio, all those valuation metrics, uh, cheap on a discount cash flow basis. Those companies tend to outperform rather than the growth companies we've seen over the last decade. That's what you're talking about. So high inflation may mean you don't need to take more risk. By the way, lower volatility companies, Correct. lower risk exactly companies right. yeah. tend to outperform. So from what you're saying, yeah, it's pretty idiotic. People saying, high inflation, I'll take more risk because I need more return. Yeah, and, and this is uh, exactly what happens. You know, you, you think you've got to, you're trying to beat uh, other uh, macroeconomic uh, parameters that are impacting your, your current cash flow, as it were. Then, yeah, that's what you're going to be looking for. And it's not always, not always the best thing to do. Your risk capital should always remain the same, ultimately. And you should be veering towards value in high inflation. Yeah, and again, um, I really want to underline that because the funny thing is, out of a, I say, almost an idiotic comment that somebody had made, uh, we're able to give them that data and the research and going back quite a long way. By the way, for those who want to see it, that's on um, my free Telegram channel, uh, is that data on value and why value versus growth in high inflation. Uh, and there's little advantages like that which can differentiate the wheat from chaff. Okay, any other idiotic things you've seen this past week uh, that really struck stuck out and you thought, what the hell was that person thinking? Yeah, yeah, there were a couple. You know, people are yeah, they were always uh, trying, to, trying to find, you know, as they say in the markets, uh, you try and pick the bottoms, you get smelly fingers. But, uh, and, you know, as the market is falling, uh, there, there were a couple of instances, particularly in the crypto market, where they were saying, I'm going to get in now because I believe this is the bottom. And I'm saying, well, why don't you just hang on for a month and see if it does actually bottom out as opposed to trying to find, uh, you know, buy into a falling knife, as it were. Yeah, yeah that bottom fishing uh, where it's idiotic for a couple of reasons. One is you've got to try and perfectly time things. Now, that means you've got a crystal ball or a time machine. But it's idiotic for another reason. You don't need to go all in at yeah. the point you think's the bottom. You could start small and average in, you know, dollar cost average, pound cost averaging. And statistically, that's often shown to be a better way of doing it. So, again, you can sort of have an idiotic idea. I think there's the bottom. I think there's high inflation. I think. But actually, we can sort of give you a bit of extra information and turn what's what sort of got the essence of. I mean, it's a bit like think, okay, think of it this way. It's like there's a diamond but it's surrounded by a cow pat, right? And we, our job is to show you the diamond in the middle, I guess, yeah. uh, because what they're doing around it is coming up with some things which are, you know, halfway there. 
Um, so yeah, I think I think on that point as well, uh, the, the crypto, whatever it is, crypto or anything else, that's yeah. hugely volatile. If you really want to do the crypto thing, and I'll I'll tell you a second about my NFT that I bought, which was idiotic, but there's a reason I was purposely idiotic. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can pan cost average. Just start small, see how it goes. And you know, it's amazing how often you change your views on something. You know, you buy five stocks, let's say in your ISA, a month goes by, one of them's down fifteen percent, one of them's up fifteen percent. You're thinking to yourself. I think I'm getting a better idea of which one of these was the better pick and which ones I might want to add a bit more capital to and so on. Uh, yeah, well, and, uh, yeah, on that particular point on crypto particularly, you know, it, and I say this time and again with a lot of people who want to uh, invest in cryptocurrencies and historically we've known there have been coins which come and go so quickly. And the basis is, you know, what is the purpose of this? Where's the value? Where's the inherent value? Uh, you know, and is it secured against any real business plan? Uh, so you can undo yourself if you don't ask these uh, relevant questions, particularly in that market. So, no, but I guess some people, it's a bit like art. They're just selling it to somebody who might buy it for more. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, bloody hell, a Jackson Pollock. Where's the inherent value of a guy sticking a paint can on a rope and then swinging it about? Right. Where's the inherent value? Well, it gives a lot of people a lot of joy. That's the only inherent value I can think of. And somebody in Japan's willing to pay more probably in a couple of years time. Interestingly, speaking of art, I was looking at a whole database. I keep getting these adverts pop up saying, hey, invest in art. You know how it's done loads better. And then there's another one which is chasing me, which is, hey, invest in wine. That's an alternative asset class, which has done incredibly well. Mm -hmm. So I looked at the art one and this fund and I looked at some of the artists who were the flavor of the month many years ago damien hurst and they explained how look at this damien hurst one it went up 800 percent. and then i went down and looked at some of the other damien hurst ones which were down 50 percent, 60 percent. and could i tell a difference between that set of dots that he did cut multicolored dots and he's done it and another set of multicolored dots and i couldn't and the vast majority got it. now damien hurst back in the day was the thing just like today's mm -hmm. nfts or cryptos uh, whereas others have kept their value. For some reason, he didn't. Um, and he had his formaldehyde cow, cow if you remember, at the, um, at the, was it Sainsbury's uh, wing of the um, Tate Modern or something? Anyway, so the, the way I look at NFTs, and I bought my first NFT, uh, but I did it more to understand the process, not because I think something amazing is going to happen. So which one did you buy? Uh, it was Axiom. It was one of the Axiom one ones. I'm happy to sell it to you if you wish for 10 times what I paid for it. That's very kind of you. Well, we'll have that discussion offline. It's my pleasure. I mean, it's called, idiot, it's, it's called Idiot Investor. We've got to try and sell each other something, <laughs> each show probably. But yeah, so I bought it. With, with But the real value in it, it occurred to me, is the what they call the utility around it. Mm. Um, the You know, I can go watch a launch at Cape Canaveral, meet astronauts. That utility is a bit like a private members club. Mm. And I can see how we might create a private investors members club, let's say, the Alpesh and Peresh NFT, where only people who have got that NFT can be part of it. And you could always sell your seat in the future and we'll have a limited number of seats. I can see that being a use to it. So it's more a utility or private members club as opposed to a piece of art. So there are things that are like that. Um, and, and yeah, it's clever and all the rest of it. But anyway, I bought the first one and it was uh, Axiom One, which which are the people behind SpaceX and the rockets. So I thought if you're going to go, I mean, you might as well, literally, because all these kids on TikTok keep saying, to the moon, so I thought, well, yeah. know, which is literally going to the moon. So because they're building something out for a moon mission. Um, anything else idiotic that's happened this week? Well, uh, let me ask you this. US interest rates have risen half a percent. Uh, yeah. Biggest hike in 20 years. Yeah. And the UK raised rates today? Just a quarter basis quarter point, yeah. which is driving everybody nuts, yeah. as in too little, too much, shouldn't have done it. What, what, too late. What, what's your take too on it? Too late, yeah, possibly. Who knows? We've, we've enjoyed low interest rates for such a long time. Um, maybe we became a bit complacent with it. Or, um, you know, I remember back in the day in the 90s when it was 17%. Yeah. And I was buying a mortgage, I was getting mortgages uh, for 14 to 17% back then. Yeah. So even now, it still seems cheap. It may, you know, I guess it depends where you are in this curve. You know, if you're a lot younger, it's going to impact you a bit more, possibly. But when you've come through it like we have, uh, I'm not saying you're old, Alpish, but you know. May. 
you seen the gray yeah. there's only so much a dye can do <laughs> and then it's like even the the black of the dye can't clear it out i mean i i'm not looking at this interest rate stuff as i mean i did think for a minute the fed yesterday was a potential game changer because the dow rallied 900 points or something stupid i thought well, okay is this going to turn things around people say right we're going to avoid a recession uh, because they've done this in a timely manner, not too high. It's Goldilocks all over again. But looking at the futures contracts as we're recording this, and it's the 5th of May, uh, it doesn't look like it's a game changer. It looks like the market's going to continue going downwards. And that's what the yeah. momentum is. It's downward at the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I thought as well when I was looking at it this morning. It's uh, it's not so much too little, too late. It, uh, you know, the pandemic particularly uh, has meant uh, the governments themselves have had to borrow so much. It's going to take a little while to come out of this, uh, you know, this era of uh, debt. And uh, I you, think that's not always the best. You used to trade, was it Japanese bonds? The Japanese government Did you bonds. do interest rate products? I mean, I guess the bonds are interest bonds rate products. Bonds are interest rate products, yeah. So yeah. they're all interest rate products pretty much on the floor. Yeah. The burn, the BTP, the bubble. Yeah, so then you had the FTSE index. So what's your sort of what's your give us some secret inside knowledge from your experience of trading those futures contracts on the floor of the exchange as to <laughs> uh as to now? Or is it oh just follow the momentum, guys? If it goes up, yeah. it goes up, well, it goes down, down. Exactly. Look, I, I fell into that trap when I first started and I thought, goodness me, I don't have the same uh, same knowledge as you'd expect from an ox. Oxbridge graduate who who probably has uh, you know immersed himself in in this field. We're and amazing, it, mate. We can look into the future, and we're part exactly. of a secret society which controls the earth. Yeah, exactly. And so it was all about taking what little, what little you can from movements in the market, and you you absolutely adore volatility because that's the only time you can get uh, uh, get something out of it. Otherwise, it's very quiet and very lonesome. A uh, role tab. This also is uh, it's important. It's a proper job. You physically got not physically, uh, it's mentally draining because you're just waiting for things to happen sometimes. So uh, yeah, I I didn't have any opinion when I was on the floor whether the interest rate weights went up or down. Yeah, it was just interesting to be at that moment to see the reaction, and you'd you'd uh, your reaction should be very sharp uh, to make the most of any movements whether they're up or down. So I had no interest in, in what was going on, in all honesty. No, and that's what I've heard from a lot of floor traders. The problem with that is that's fine if you're on the floor because yeah. you're right there. You're getting the information before anybody else. But once the electronic age arrived, you could, I mean, there's no way of making use of any of that now, is there? No, well, interestingly, that I was right on the cusp of that uh, when the APT yeah. thing was called the automated pit trading uh, started, and I was one of the first traders. About 1998, 99-ish, wasn't it? 97-ish. 97, that's right. Yeah. 97, I was one of the first to actually uh, imbibe that whole electronic trading on the floor. So it's on the floor, we had actually electronic um, terminals. And at the end of the day, you'd have a whole load of traders behind you shouting orders, so you'd end up being a broker as well as trading your own book. Which yeah. is fun, but uh, yeah, those uh, th that was that was a turning point for a lot of people on the floor. Where it uh, it that's where you needed the real skill because you couldn't ask your mate next to you, "Can you get me out of this contract?" Because you knew that you knew they had a client who was ringing up who had X number to buy or sell. Yeah. So all of that had gone. Uh, that yeah. leaning on someone it came a lot harder for sure. Yeah, no, I know that. I mean, well, you and I know the number of floor traders who you bump into them years later at, a, at an investment bank and they're the janitor or something. You know, they're working behind reception. And you ask them, what the heck? And they go, well, you know what? I left school at 16. The floor trading thing made me money, but so what? It's just another job. Now I've got to do this. It's different and, and whatever. And, and uh, I admire the, their resilience and ability to switch. Chris, right. Anything else? Well, just on that point, yeah, you on. know, they, you, they, there was a there was a pure humbleness with a lot of the traders. You know, they a lot of them didn't have big egos like that. When when it was time to move on, they they embraced it quite uh, eloquently. Yeah, no, I've noticed that about them, and and I think it's something that I notice also about people who, if they've left school at sixteen as opposed to gone to university, and I, I've got friends in both categories. Ones who've gone to university and invested a lot in their careers and their lives um, are more attached to what they've acquired. 
that there's a fear of losing anything. Whereas those who never had the chance to acquire and and, and had a, maybe a tougher upbringing, yeah. left skirt 16, seem to be more adaptable, more resilient, and just more sure. get on with it. They're also, you know, a couple of my friends who are in that category are, are a lot more successful now as well. I think there's an element where that education almost holds you back. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the danger is... <clears throat> it, 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 you don't see that actually you need not just have the education, but all the other life skills to succeed as well. And you're not entitled to, you know, a cushy number, which is what some people thought, oh, I've got a degree now. Where's my, where's my paycheck and my job for life? That's right. You need to be uh, a full uh, package, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. And not it's least because everybody's got a bloody degree now. They're giving away like toffee. I mean, you've even got a degree. It's true. Yeah. What was yeah. it? Engineering, wasn't it as well? It was actually called industrial studies and it was engineering based up in Sheffield. Yeah. So when you came back, when you came to Oxford, I was in Sheffield. Yeah, well, you're old, in other words, is what you're saying. But yeah. <laughs> no, young. Sure. Are you younger than me? No, I'm 50, should I say? 54 soon. You're hell of a lot older than me. Jeez, you're like almost 10 years older than me. Maybe 20. <laughs> yeah. Wishful thinking. Um, we better leave it there because yeah. otherwise we're going to run out of. Too, we're going to say too many idiotic things. Um, yeah. Next week, we'll hope to educate people with a sense of humor and through the idiocies of investors that are out there. And hopefully through that, people will learn something on what not to do as well. So I want to thank All you right. again, Paresh. Any, any closing thoughts? Uh, no closing thoughts. But if a broker does give you a, a tip, then uh, that's all well and good. But make sure he tells you when to get out of it. Yeah, I remember you messaged me this. You said, yeah, brokers are great at telling you when to get in. They're rubbish at telling you when to get out. I mean, I normally give people a, a, a rule, which is, look, 12 months, or if it falls 25% from the highest it's been since you bought it, another 25% stop trading, stop loss. Within that, you might change your mind. You might say, no, I'm going to change my mind. No, this has happened. That, that's fine. But at least at the entry, you got some backstop default and right. not just, oh, I'll just wait till 50 years are over. Yeah. Thank you. So on Good. that thought, hopefully people will do less idiotic investing things. Thank you very much. See you later.